Greetings and salutations, everyone. Today we're going to take a look at the market revolution of the early 19th century, a unique time where the economy of this country, the inventions and innovations were all creating something new for the people who are living here and a greater incentive to people to come here. So let's get started. The first half of this time is of the 19th century is referred to as a market revolution because of the radical transformation that happened inside this country. Now, these are both innovations in transportation as well as communication. Some of our big characteristics of the market revolution of the early 19th century was the creation of a national market. The idea that stuff is not just coming from Georgia or New York, but it's coming from the United States of America as a whole. We see that there is an increase in concentration of economic activities around urban areas and around what will become factories. The Industrial Revolution started in the 1780s, and by the early 19th century, the components of it are starting to arrive within the United States. We see there's more of an increase in mobility of stuff around the country, and there's new ways to approach the social conflicts that are being uh, kind of created, and markets are going to become more resistant to outside forces and big overnight change. The first big advance we see is gonna come in the form of transportation. And that happens with the construction of toll roads. Now these toll roads will originally be called turnpikes and they were for private companies, for state, for local government. The average person is not going to use a turnpike. They have their own ways of getting around. They have their own routes of getting around. They are definitely not uh, significantly faster than going anywhere else. It's faster, but by no means is it fast. The thing that really starts to speed up transportation and lower the cost of everything is going to be steamboats. And in 1807, we see our first steamboat will enter the Hudson River. See, for example, there's our fancy looking turnpike roads. Wow, look at that. The first turnpike does still exist. Uh, it's located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and was opened in 1790. This is the Cumberland Road, and it, again, started as a private road for uh, transportation of private companies, the federal government, your well-to-do individuals. Most folks are not going to need a system like this. They're not going to be traveling long ways. This is still the time where a person is going to be born and die and probably not travel more than 50 miles in their entire life. So if you were born in Baltimore, you're probably never going to get to Indianapolis, for example. This route wouldn't work for you. If you're on the frontier though, and you need those resources, that's where routes like this are gonna be significant. The steamboat was the bigger game changer because you could carry way more stuff on it. Your transportation costs went down very, very fast. And it was relatively easy to produce. The only hindrance to the steamboat is it's got to go on water, obviously. And there's not always a water source to get your things to where you want to go. So people start building canals. Canals are man-made waterways. And these were definitely big construction projects. The Erie Canal, for example, took four years to finish and it was done purely on private capital. There was no federal funding that happened. And when you dig a canal like this, the way they dug the Erie Canal is you essentially dig a trench 30 feet deep, 80 feet wide, and then you just dig towards the ocean. And then 
when you finally get to your body of water, you just use either dynamite or some extremely brave slash stupid people are in there the last few hundred feet chiseling to the sea wall. When you break through, the entire canal fills in a matter of like a day. And there's our canal system. It connected all of upstate New York. And the Erie Canal is our principal canal, but feeding off of it were several other canals, which allowed for transportation of goods, resources, folks, and ultimately money as well. There were other canals that were created throughout the late early 19th century, and they all did the same thing, get people, goods, and stuff moving. Now, canals are great, but there's still a lot of work that goes into them, and you can only work them to an existing waterway. You have to dig towards an ocean, one of the Great Lakes, a significant river, something like that. Trains, by comparison, could be built anywhere the ground was flat, or at the very least, relatively flat. It does need a lot of manufacturing to go into it. Steel at this time, is, or hell, even iron at this time, is very difficult to work with. You need 1400 degrees just to get iron to a temperature it can work with. And then you need coal, which is not hard to get, it's not hard to find, it's definitely hard to get, but it's a lot of stuff that goes into this. The first rail line in this country won't open until 1828. By 1860, though, by the dawn of the Civil War, this country has more than 30,000 miles of train line in it, and that's more train line than the rest of the world combined. The was some speculation that a train was never going to be as successful as a good old fashioned horse and buggy. But the iron horse race of 1830 proved that in a fair flat race, yeah, that train could do more than that horse. The railroads that we see here are constructed all across the country. And we see that immigrant labor is more likely to build the Northern railroads and slave labor is more likely to build the Southern railroads. The, if you look at this map, you're also noticing, wow, in the South, there's a lot less train track that's created. And one of the things that's going to hinder uh, train track construction in the South is agriculture. If you had large amounts of land, you didn't want a train going through it. It's better for it just to go around it. Well, why do you need that at all if you're just carrying cotton? So it, it was definitely an argument that slowed railroad construction in the South. By 1870, 17. If you're going from Cincinnati, and Cincinnati you might have seen on the last couple of slides, wondering why are we using Cincinnati as a barometer for distance from New York? It's because this was considered the last vestige of quote unquote civilized life before you got to the frontier. And over the course of three and a half decades, the travel time is cut from a 52 day horse and buggy ride to a seven-day train ride, and the cost also falls by over 95%. Everywhere we see that the train lines are being constructed, we're also seeing telegraph lines being constructed. And what the telegraph is, is a method of sending electronic communication at the speed of light. And the frequent the uh, communication code is Morse code named after Samuel Morse and it is really just two kinds of tones a long tone and a short tone but the combination of these tones means you can send a electronic communication at the speed of light to arrive instantaneously somewhere else the only thing that's going to hinder it is you need somebody on the other end to be able to know the code. It's not a complex code, but it, it's just like learning another language, essentially. 
There's our first telegraph, there's Samuel Morse. And all this new transformation means that for people in the West, we actually see that the West as a region will start to grow much quicker because of this. With the new technology to move, people are going to go out West. With all the stuff that can now be moved with them, you can get your resources quicker too. Prior to the early 19th century, going west was pretty much just going into the great beyond, the frontier where you might not see someone else again for months at a time. But now that you have access to all the creature comforts you might accept or expect from the east coast, more and more people are likely to go into this new frontier. Cotton is a really wonderful thing to have for clothing goes. Uh, I'd be willing to bet that every person who is watching this or hearing my voice is wearing at least one article of clothing that contains cotton, whether it's your denim jeans, your socks, your underoos, whatever. Cotton is great. It's light, it breathes, you can dye it any color, it's very durable, but it is extremely difficult to grow. And once you grow it, you have to harvest it a very specific way. If you just grab the little cotton balls off the stalks, you might prick yourself on your thorns and then well, you, your clothes are gonna be red or pink. And even before you can turn the cotton balls into fibers and yarns and thread, you have to remove the cotton seeds from within. And this is a process of just pulling it apart. But when you consider how small a cotton ball is and you have to pull apart four or five seeds from it, it's a tremendously slow going process. This is why until the mid 19th century, plantation owners are probably not gonna grow crops or not gonna grow cotton too extensively because it's just not worth it. That is until the development of Eli Whitney's cotton engine. The cotton gin is a machine that works to separate cotton balls into looser fibers and allows the seeds to fall out. And this is what an early cotton gin would look like. You would drop cotton in the top, you turn the crank, the fibers would loosen, the seeds would fall out, and then you'd have something you could work with. This sped up the cleaning of cotton by a factor of 50. And all of a sudden, if you had the means to grow cotton, you were probably going to grow cotton. The demand for cotton had always been there, but it was a luxury good. There was so much effort that went into this. With the development of the cotton gin, we also see the increase of slaves to work and pick the cotton. It creates a vicious cycle. You have the slaves to work the fields, you get more money, you can afford more slaves, you grow more cotton, therefore you need more slaves, and, and voila, we have a situation where cotton and slavery becomes the backbone of Southern economy. This takes decades for it to happen, but it does happen. It's not just the cotton gin Eli Whitney is known for. His much more significant contribution is interchangeable parts. The idea that if a part, an individual part broke and his first interchangeable parts were for firearms, then you would not replace the entire uh, gun. You would just replace, for example, the firing pin itself. From the 1820s to the 1860s, we see the number of urban areas in this country really starts to swell. Like you can see in our population chart on the 1820s, you only have one town with a population of over 100,000 people, and that's gonna be New York. Four decades later, you have population cities that are approaching the million person mark, and lots more dotted throughout the landscape. As far as Americans go, they are copiers, they are innovators, 
and they're willing to try anything, even to see if wonder what will happen. I wonder if I do this, what will happen. I wonder how successful this would be. In 1800, from 1792 through 1800, there were 41 patents that were approved. In 1860, that number has increased by a factor of 4,000. We see some of our more interesting developments will be uh, the steam carriage, what is a, an extreme um, early rendition of a aqua car. We see the automated flour mill. No longer do you need wind to grind your grain. We see John Deere and his steel plow, which makes it much easier to, har to uh, plant crops. The mechanical reaper developed by McCormick that makes it so much easier to harvest said crops. The transatlantic cable will connect the Americas to Western Europe and East Asia so that you can send a electronic communication and have it instantaneously read on the other side of the planet. No longer here's a letter you put on a boat and you hope well in a couple of months that hopefully will get to where it needs to go. The Singer sewing machine meant that you could create clothing in a matter of minutes instead of a matter of days. And then you've got the father of the factory system himself, Samuel Slater. These early factories from Slater and even Lowell's were designed to have all the methods of production located in one place to have in one location everything from raw material to finished product created in one location and the Lowell mills were where we're going to focus on because they were an entire administrative quote-unquote campus system that we see uh, they were water powered because as long as the water is going as long as the Merrimack River is flowing then the factory has power and this was for textiles it's for making clothing and this is going to operate at the dawn of the 19th century the role of making clothing and textiles had historically been women's work. So a lot of the people who are employed in loyalist factories are going to be women. Um, they might be the daughter of your farming people in New England. And if you were working here, this was some of the first industry that we're going to see. But the life for people who live in the Lowell factories is really highly regulated. The times you wake up, the times you go to bed, the times that you eat, the times that you sleep, what you're allowed to wear, how much you're allowed to be paid. All of it is very strictly regulated. Typically speaking, if you're working in a textile mill, a textile factory, if you're a cloth worker, you're paid for how much you finish. For every article of clothing you make, you are paid. And in 1836, you would average 40 to 80 cents a day. Eight year, uh, six years later, we see that number would go up to about 14.50 a month. Now, a week it included six days everyone has sunday off and you're working 12 hour days now this is that's a lot of work that's a lot of hours and workers were requesting we should work less we shouldn't have to work this much and paid so little and they had been consistently looking for the 10 hour day but even then it was really the only chance you'd get to work that little hours would be if you had some type of skill the Lowell Female Labor Reform Association went to the state of Massachusetts. This group of factory workers wanted so much to have better working conditions that they, for the first time ever, go to the legislature and say, hey, the labor conditions here are really rough. We need something else. And 
the legislature, when they hear these women talking about how bad things are, about how little they're paid, about how hard they're worked, at first the legislature of Massachusetts says, well, that's not really something we want to regulate. We don't want to regulate private businesses. And that was the way it went. And for over a decade, nothing happens until about 1853, when slowly the first mills started adopting the 11 hour day. And that was, you know, hooray, an extra hour where you don't have to work, but factories are gonna start to hire more and more immigrant labor too. And the immigrant labor is paid much less. And that was, that was that. We do see some groups who start to unionize pretty quickly. The Working Man's Party in 1829, the uh, ultimately leads to the Commonwealth versus Hunt, where different political parties tried to control who and how people could work. Now, ultimately these early movements didn't really pan out to anything because they were extremely localized. They were usually very weak. They were usually more interested on a social change, not the betterment of all labor. So nothing big came from a lot of these early movements. Different parts of the country also see different specialized regions. Uh, in the East, we see you're more likely to have industrial specialization. In the South, cotton and slavery, while the West was the breadbasket for the nation. From 1840 to 1860, we see there's 4 million immigrants will come to the United States. Most of these people are German, most of them are Irish, and they're gonna settle in the North, they're gonna settle in the Midwest. And the reason that we see so many people coming during this time is because in Ireland, there's the potato famine. And the potato is a crop that was not native to Ireland. It was native to the Americas, but it's so easy to grow. The calories are so good and so strong that it became staple food in Ireland. When a blight, which is kind of like a plant virus, started wiping out the potato, we see that there's a million Irish who are gonna die of hunger, and then another million more are going to emigrate to trying to find a better life. Now, these people would be hired to do anything, dig canals, build railroads, work in factories. And the conditions were so bad that these people could be paid almost nothing, and still it was a vast step up, but they're also treated so bad that it was definitely a great step down. With the rise of so many new native, uh, with the rise of so many new immigrant groups, we see that there's a rise of nativism as well. Distrust for immigrants, hatred for foreigners, um, which was strongest against Catholic immigrants as well. The fear that these people had stolen the jobs and would vote along the Democratic Party line were reasons why natives weren't happy with this. The transformations that we start to see in this country in the area of communications, innovations, transformations of, tra of everything also led to a cultural revolution, a social revolution, the Second Great Awakening, a religious revival movement. Low church attendance in the mid 19th century was one of the principal causes to start this religious revival. And the goal of it is to get more people interested in coming back to church with work and life being distractors, with people being more interested in, I need to spend this time for my family, I need to spend this time making money, I'll go to church when I can, we see that there's a big drop off in this. And the Second Great Awakening 
did a lot of things to get people back into church services. Uh, a lot of our ministers at this time would preach that the idea of free will to the people. Some of these revivals were more orchestrated plays and, and stage shows than they were sermons. During this time, we also see the emergence of Mormonism and the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, a group that focused on family, on rejecting of alcohol, and originally polygamy too. But when the founder of Mormonism uh, was his practice of polygamy upset some of his neighbors. Um, they moved to Illinois, where ultimately he was murdered. And Brigham Young, who assumed the presidency of the Mormon faith, would lead them to Utah. Some groups during this time are going to get very wealthy. And one of these individuals we're going to see is going to be a uh, John Astor, Mr. Astor right here. Uh, he became wealthier than we had ever seen a person become at this point. He, at the time of his death, and he was a shipping magnate, was worth about $10 million. And when you consider the cost of inflation, this would be the equivalent of having over $100 billion today. And this is a guy who came from nothing, rags to riches kind of story, and showed that in America, there could be almost no limit to prosperity. But by the same notion, we saw the greatest hindrance to prosperity was if you were not white. Um, blacks usually lived in some of the poorest sections of cities they were subject to violence and lynching. And one of the reactions to this was the creation of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And this was founded by Richard Allen, who wanted to create a church for African Americans after a group of had been banned for a prayer. And if you are African-American, you may be barred from getting a more skillful job, a carpentry, masonry, blacksmithing, ironwork. And the justification for this was if blacks competed with whites, then whites would lose out. And then, oh, white supremacy would disappear. And oh dear, wouldn't that be horrible? Some states are even going to deny African-Americans from entering the state itself. Today we took a look at how the market revolution led to changes in communication, transportation, social, political, economic impacts. Hope you learned something. I'll see you next time.